No, it looks like it's now working. Yeah. Let's test it though, just to be sure. Hello. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for joining us on this Wednesday in September. Uh, most of you probably know this is our fifth practice manager learning series, and I'm really excited today to have Schwartz and Hannah, an employment attorney out of Andover, join us again. Some of you may recognize them from our HR boot camp that we had back in January. Um, and today we're going to be focusing specifically on your practice's employee handbook. Um, after the HR boot camp, we had a lot of requests from practices for some more support with building and creating their employee handbook. So I'm thrilled to have them here to help us with that today. Um, as always, we do have a couple housekeeping notes. We have attendees virtually in Bridgewater and also in Northampton. Um, so if you could keep down the conversations privately between yourselves, it does make it difficult for them to hear our presentation. Um, for the other sites, you can either chat in your messages or you can contact Anna or I directly um, and we can pass those along. We've left quite a bit of open time at the end because we do want you to be able to um, talk to Gary specifically about any issues that you have and questions that you have. Um, so at the end of the presentation, we'll have an open forum for questions from practices here and also at our remote locations. Um, so before we get started, just a few little pieces of housekeeping. Um, I wanted to give you an update about some PPOC happenings, including a new learning management system uh, that you'll see more of on September 20th at our next practice manager meeting. Um, the practice manager meeting is held in Waltham, but it's also broadcast via Zoom. So please feel free to log in remotely for that meeting. You'll see that in the weekly roundup, of course, and then it's been uh, posted up on Open Pediatrics for those of you who are using Open Pediatrics. There was recently a Mass Medical Society notification that came out, and they, we got a lot of questions about medical assistance specifically and their ability to uh, give immunizations in your clinic. So I'm gonna talk about that really quickly and tell you where you can find some more information. Um, and then Tufts has actually offered some private children's practice um, trainings. There was one yesterday that was for inpatient, but next Tuesday they're going to be giving trainings on um, prior authorizations on their website. And then the week after that, there'll be a training on behavioral health authorizations through the website. So I wanted to let you know, because I know we do have um, some people that have problems getting authorizations. And so we think this will be a good way. You can send um, anyone in your office. It is via Zoom. So if you have a referrals person or an authorizations person, uh, that information is also in the roundup. And again, it's posted on Open Pediatrics for you. Um, so really quickly, I'm excited to tell you that, oh, we have one more learning community this year, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, October 8th. As of right now, my goal is to use that to review EPIC reports, specifically financial EPIC reports. And so I'm hoping to have some of our financial analysts come in and the training team. And so hopefully uh, some of you can attend for that one as well. Um, and then that will be done for 2019 and then we'll start working on our schedule for 2020. So you'll hear more about that later on. Um, Gary is here with us. He is, as I mentioned, from Schwartz and Hannum. Um, they're in Andover. Um, I'll let him tell you a little bit about his background, but before I do that, I just wanted to um, talk to you about, again, the upcoming practice manager meeting on Friday, September 20th. We are going to show you this new learning management system. The, we named it Umbrella because it encompasses a lot. So it will not just be for your EPIC trainings. Today, when you have a new staff person come on, you, we'll have you send them to learning at PPOC where they'll do their pre-EPIC trainings and their post-EPIC trainings. This new learning management system will actually have resources based on department. We can set up privileges. So practice managers will be assigned to different things than say, for instance, your front desk person or a PPOC staff member. 
we're really excited about it and our team has actually been working on building this for a September 23rd launch. So it's coming pretty quickly and I hope that um, everybody takes the opportunity to get in there and see what we have there to offer you. Um, the nice thing about it is it's totally customizable. So if you have ideas about things that we can put up there to make it more useful for you and your practice, uh, that would be great. As practice managers, you'll have the ability to look at your staff and see what trainings they've done on what trainings are overdue and things like that. So it gives us a little bit more control over the trainings that the that your staff members are doing as they relate to uh, Epic. So for instance, if you want all of your front desk to do a my chart training, you'll be able to run reports and see who has and hasn't done that. Um, so I think that will be a nice feature for our practice managers. So the Mass Medical Society has uh, put out a new uh, report this week specifically related to the amended Board of Registration um, statute that came out. And they are saying that medical services delegated to medical assistants that they can still give immunizations, okay? So this information can be found in this week's roundup. There's a link to the FAQ. There's a link to um, MGL chapter 112, which is the one that actually addresses the medical assistants. Um, but just so you all know, we did get a lot of questions as soon as that announcement came out that they were limiting the things that medical assistants could do under the direction of a physician. Um, um, but giving the immunizations is still allowed. So look in this week's roundup. I'm hoping everybody in this room receives the roundup. If you don't, let us know. We'll make sure that you get it. Um, review the information. And then Crico, who is the malpractice insurer, is also working on putting together some, um, some documentation for us surrounding it. <laughs> Okay, and so I mentioned we have primary care authorizations via Zoom next Tuesday, the 17th, and then the week after that, behavioral health care authorizations. They're in open pediatrics, and they're also um, available in the Roundup. Um, so again, it doesn't have to be you. You might not be the appropriate person to attend those type of trainings, but at least send somebody from your practice, whoever is handling your uh, tasks, both commercial and public. Uh, so their goal is to make both their systems one. So this will cover both your commercial and your public. Okay, um, any questions about any of the stuff that I just went over right now? I'm sorry if I went really fast. <laughs> Do a quick question. Yes. Last time we had was the, um, the uh, callback Please remind the system any update on that? Yeah, that actually was on my presentation and I pulled it off, but uh, it's actually with legal. So right now legal is working with Solution Reach. Um, I know I've been pinging them basically every week. Some of you are pinging me often because we're really excited about the opportunity to offer a uh, Solution Reach to you. So as soon as legal finishes theirs, then we'll start kicking that off across the PPOC. Good question. Any other questions? Great. All right. Well, with that said, I would like to welcome Gary from Schwartz and Hannum. He will be presenting today on employee handbooks. And again, um, feel free to ask questions. We want these presentations to be as interactive as, as possible. And at the end, we'll definitely have some time available if you have specific questions about your practice. <coughs> Hello everyone, thanks for uh, having me here today. Very excited to be here, get out of the office and speak to you about employee handbooks. Uh, as Leah said, my name is Gary Finley. I had a chance to speak with a number of you this past uh, January when we had our employment law boot camp, And immediately after that, we started talking about uh, what the next presentation could be. And from what I understand, the overwhelming feedback is, well, we want to know more about employee handbooks. And so my challenge today was to, is to make a presentation that's uh, helpful to you, but yet different from what you learned before. So there'll be very little overlap between what I talked about today and what we spoke about in January. Uh, one of the original ideas that we kicked around was having a workshop where we'd all bring in our employee handbooks, talk about the particular policies and kind of work on getting them up to, uh, up to date and legally compliant. Uh, given the number of people we have here, that's simply not practical, but I kind of took that spirit uh, and created this presentation, hopefully you'll agree. It's very kind of practical, nuts and bolts, step by step, what you can do to get your handbook from where it is right now to where you want it to be. 
So before I hop into that, just to back up a tiny bit, uh, my name is Gary Finley. I work at a law firm called Schwartz Hannum out of Andover. We have about 15 uh, lawyers on staff. And one of the big things, one of the two big things we do is to help employers of all sizes with, uh, with labor and employment issues. So dealing with employees from creating the right types of policies, um, contracts, things like that, to when there's a dispute with an employee, uh, a question over how much they should get paid, whether they deserve overtime. Uh, if there's a discrimination claim filed, we can help you work through that. And uh, if it gets to it, kind of, um, to help you defend against that. Uh, so if that is a need of yours, and it, it tends to be at some point in the life, life of a practice, hopefully less often than, um, than, than more often, uh, please, please give us a call. We do have a relationship with PPOC where uh, you'll be charged our lower uh, nonprofit rate um, because we value, value the partnership. But uh, if you're ever, ever having issues or even kind of proactively, if you'd like to have someone on deck, we can get you on um, as an employee, as a um, as a client, with kind of a, kind of a no risk, uh, no risk, no charge kind of way. There's um, um, so that's that. Uh, so in today's presentation, I have about thirty different slides. Again, we'll try to be really nuts and bolts. Try to throw you into some situations, um, with, with, with hypotheticals as to um, putting together a uh, putting together an employee handbook. And do hope to have about thirty minutes at the end to answer your particular questions and make this as useful as possible to you. Here we go. So the first slide is called "Welcome to the Practice." I'm going to read this uh, this scenario to you may be familiar, may not, but um, Pat, the practice manager, is new to Peninsula Pediatrics. Having decided to downshift from an administrative position in a large urban hospital to the PM job at a small coastal pediatrics practice. One of Pat's first assignments is to create an employee handbook for the practice. After asking about the practice's current employment-related policies, Pat is handed a key drive on which Pat finds a 20-page Word document of unknown origin entitled Employee Handbook. So my question for you is, uh, what questions should Pat be asking and what, are, what should Pat's next steps be? Yes, in fact. Are the, are the policies that are in that document followed and current? Very good. Yeah, I think those are two important and distinct questions to ask. Um, are these policies current and are they being followed? You obviously want them to be both. If they're not being followed, one of two things can happen. You should be changing, um, you should be changing the policy or changing your practice. So we deal with these situations all the time. An employer will say, I think it's time that we need to take a look at our, at our employee handbook. Um, this is what we have, it's, it's not very much. And so a few questions pop into my mind that, 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 I, that, I, would, that I would ask them. Um, yours are a couple of them. Um, I wanna know when it was written. I wanna know who drafted it. Have any or all employees been given this handbook? So has it been published or is it just, a draft, just in draft form? Are the policies legally correct? Are there any missing policies? So anything in there that, that, should, that, anything that should be in there that isn't? Are the policies being followed? Um, and are there other policies out there? So is this the complete set? Um, or are there, are there kind of stray policies um, uh, that, uh, that are not included in that, that handbook? Um, and so, so that would, so if you came to me with this, that would kind of be my whole work too. Let's figure out all these questions and then we can move on to the next steps. So this is what I want to talk to you about today. Um, why is a handbook important? Uh, overview of the audit process, assessing the current policies. Uh, once you get there, how do you organize your new handbook? Uh, what do you do once you have a draft? What are the next steps that you need to take before you actually hit, uh, hit send and, and give it to all your employees? Uh, then, then kind of the annual review process and, um, and what you can be doing right now. So why is an employee handbook um, important? 
first of all, it communicates the policies and procedures to employees. This is what this is how we do things around here. I think we think of handing someone an employee handbook, they read it through one time, and then they put it away. But that's not really what it is at all. A good handbook is a good reference point for employees. If they have a question, they can consult it. Uh, but again, that only works if you're actually following the following practices in your handbook. It enforces the, your culture and your values. Uh, it can establish consistent expectations regarding employee conduct and work performance. Dovetails into the next one, which is if someone's doing something wrong and you fire them, you can point to a policy and say, no, 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 we didn't fire them for a discriminatory reason. We fired them because of a policy that was included in a handbook that they didn't follow. Um, follows then defending unemployment claims. So, um, so if someone is 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 fired um, and there is a um, there's a compelling reason for that, um, if there was extreme misconduct, then you may not have to pay them unemployment. So, Exhibit A and employment related lawsuits more relates to the um, discrimination claim and then below to the unemployment. Claim. Uh, but whenever, um, whenever we're um, defending a claim against one of our clients, one of the first things we ask for is the employee handbook. We'll ask for the employee file, for us for the employee handbook. We want to match those up and, um, and, and prove that there's a good reason for termination. And so you think you might want to undertake auditing your handbook, and that's what this presentation is about today. What steps are you going to take? Uh, first of all, Gather all the basic information, number of employees, location, et cetera. Uh, specific reasons why I mentioned the number of employees. Why? Why does it matter how many employees you have for your employee handbook? Because there's different regulations if you're large or small. That's exactly right. There's some magic numbers um, in Massachusetts and under federal law in terms of what benefits you need to provide people, what sort of uh, vacation they might be entitled to, so on and so time off they might be entitled to, so on and so forth. And that's based on the number of employees. Um, and I'll mention a couple of those magic numbers to you, um, to you today. Um, and so make sure, that, make sure that, that you have the right ones, you have all the ones you should have, and none of the ones that you shouldn't have, unless you want to follow them voluntarily. Uh, why is location important? It's, it's again, one of the first things I'm going to ask you if you come to me with an employee handbook and say, um, I want to know, I want to know if this needs to be revised. Go ahead. Multi-state location. That's good. Multi-state locations um, are going to require different handbooks. From what I understand, all your practices are in Massachusetts. So that makes things a little easier, a little more uniform. However, there are some um, municipalities who have specific um, of employment regulations, and so you need to be aware of those um, as well. But the single state certainly makes things a little bit easier and more uniform. You're going to evaluate all policies and procedures already in place. That means um, ones that are in your handbook, ones that are standalone policies, and things that you do that are unwritten. Um, should these be written down? Should these be included in the handbook? The answer to that may be yes. Decide the handbook length or depth that is best fit for your practice. And this is one of the things that I'll talk to you in a little bit more depth before. And you'll notice the handout that you have has two different options. Um, there's what we call a basic handbook and there's a comprehensive handbook. There's also kind of middle ground. Um, and so depending on the size, complexity of your practice, this, depending on what type of policies that you want to have, what kind of handbook that you want to have, um, you, may go, you may go a different route. Uh, decide which additional policies to incorporate. So if there are some really important legal policies that you should have, um, for instance, ones that are on a list that you don't have, you should really consider putting those in there. You're going to draft and finalize the handbook. Um, you're going to make sure you obtain employee acknowledgement. You've all seen those forms before, whether your practice has one or not. You've probably all signed them before. At the end of the handbook, I've received this. It has this policy. I acknowledge that I'm an at-will employee. Make sure to get those. Uh, because again, those are helpful if, uh, if there's ever a dispute. And then educate supervisors. So um, the, the policies are good only if they're, if they're followed. And so if, if supervisors are not, uh, are not following these policies, then again, you're going to have an issue if, if you have a lawsuit. 
Uh, and do feel free to stop me at any time. I want to ask, uh, I want to take questions at the end, but if there's anything in particular that you think is most appropriate to, uh, uh, to bring up uh, during a certain slide, please feel free to do so. Okay, so the big picture, kind of the first step in auditing, auditing where you are, what you have, and where you want to go. Back to Pat. Pat has no experience with drafting employee handbooks, but does notice a few things are missing from the handbook on the key drive. First, there's no FMLA policy. Second, gender identity is not mentioned in the equal employment opportunity policy. Finally, though vacation time was addressed in Pat's offer letter, the handbook makes no, no mention of vacation time. After asking around, Pat finds that no employee can remember ever having received a copy of the handbook. Pat concludes that the handbook is incomplete and that employees do not have sufficient information about the practices employment policy. So this is kind of this, this basic review. Let, let's, let's look at what we have. Um, and Pat issue spots a couple of things. Uh, first of all, there's no FMLA policy, uh, Family and Medical Leave Act. Does that create an issue? Very good answer. Um, Oh, so, yeah, so for people who are off-site, um, the, uh, the member of the audience, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, um, said it depends on the size, size of the practice. If you have over 50 employees um, who work within a 75-mile radius, then you should be following the Family and Medical Leave Act. If your practice does not have that many, you probably should not have an FMLA um, policy because it's going to very strongly imply that employees have more rights than you might be willing to, to give them. You know, the federal government sets, sets this cap because they understand that giving people that type of leave might be difficult for a small employer. And so that probably shouldn't be in there. I don't know if Pat knows that or not, uh, but at some point Pat should talk to someone about the policies and just kind of get, get, get a sign off. Uh, they would ask you, know, do you have 50, do you have over 50 employees? Okay, keep it in there. I do not have 50 employees, then yeah, you should probably think of taking that out unless, unless you desire to give them those, those additional rights. Um, gender identity is not mentioned in the Equal Employment Opportunity Policy. You all probably have these Equal Employment Opportunity Policies. They may be in a variety of places. They may be in, uh, in the Employee Handbook. They may be on your website. They may be in job applications. Make sure they all match up and make sure they're all current. The fact that probably a number of categories are mentioned in Pat's handbook, um, national origin, gender, so on and so forth, and gender identity is not mentioned, probably tells Pat something about the handbook. And what is that? It's old. It's probably old, because gender identity is one of the newer uh, categories, and so very good. Um, and finally, Pat knows he gets vacation because he signed an offer letter, and yet there's no vacation policy in the employee, in the employee handbook. Uh, should there be? If it's an offer letter, then it's in Yeah, I, I, th I think that's right, Leah. There's no, there's no legal requirement that you have um, a vacation policy in your employee handbook. You're not required legally to give people vacation time, but if you do, I think it's a central enough policy where you're going to want to make sure that it's applied consistently um, and that those criteria are mentioned in your, in your offer letter. I'm sorry, in, in the employee handbook. You have to offer um, all your employees an equal amount of vacation time. No. But you should have a policy that follows clear guidelines. So usually that um, vacation policy might have to do with part-time and full-time status, may have to do with how many years of uh, tenure the employee has, and so you're usually getting, going to have a chart. Um, that should be applied consistently to avoid charges of, of discrimination. Oh, and so I never really asked you, what, what, what should Pat's next steps be? Your law firm. <laughs> <laughs> my plant says call my law firm yes it's not it's not a bad idea um I, and i do want to you know 
I obviously have my own biases. I think we do a great job with this. I think that, that someone with knowledge of Massachusetts law needs to be brought in at some point in time. But I'm conscious that, that that's not the only way to do things. I want to go over so, some, some options um, with, with that. But certainly, um, you know, Pat, uh, Pat needs to, to bring in some other, um, some other heads here and, um, and get this employee handbook where, where it needs to be. All right, and so this seems very, um, very basic, but, but I think, you know, when you're at the, the when you've been hand, handed this, this big project, it's a good time to think big picture. And so number one, where are you? Pat's already starting to consider that, realizing there's, he doesn't, he or she doesn't have everything that, that, that they need here in, in this policy. Um, where you want to be, and that's about, um, that's not necessarily intuitive, and it's not necessarily one size fits all. As you can see from the two tables of contents that, that I handed, handed you, um, you may want a very expansive handbook. You may only need a, a smaller handbook, and there may be some reasons um, you know, having to do with um, you know, financially, just the size of the practice. You might consider having a smaller handbook. Um, and so it's not one size fits all. And then the obvious question is, all right, I've got this mess on this key drive. I know it's not quite right. I know I want a very comprehensive policy, a, handbook for all my employees and so what steps of what steps are we going to take and those are kind of the nuts and bolts of this um, of this presentation an important preliminary consideration involves who will draft the handbook um, and these, these are options um, some are um, objectively better than others some some involve a little bit more of opinion and some are a little bit subjective what, what works for you um, but should you adapt an existing handbook um, yours or someone else's. I, I, I bet people in this room have, have done that before. Um, should Pat adapt the handbook from his large or her urban practice? I'd say almost definitely not. There may be some policies in there that, that, are, that are a good match, but overall, the types of laws that apply um, and the depth in which uh, those laws are covered is probably not necessary or helpful to Pat and will probably be more confusing than anything else. Um, what about a practice that's around your size? Like someone sitting here, you know, we don't have an employee handbook. You want to give me yours so I can develop it? Is that a good place to start? It could be. It could be. Um, it may be that that's a great fit. It's not going to be verbatim. You still need to, to spend some extra time thinking about it. Another issue is, you know, you need to, tr you can't necessarily trust that they get, they get all the law right. So it's not the only step, but certainly can be a good starting point. Um, maybe you collect one from everyone in, in your row right here and kind of get a sense of what's out there. At this point in the process, getting started, that might be, that might be the way to go. And that might, you know, form the, the basis of, of what your handbook is. Payroll company. I imagine that, that your payroll company ha has offered you this, this product at, at some point. And, and they do it for a, um, they're gonna do it for less than, than my firm does. I'll, I'll, almost, I'll almost guarantee that. Um, we've seen their products before. Um, I think in a lot of ways they're, they're adequate. They don't always get the law the most current and they're not always great for the state specific. Um, laws. They don't necessarily, they tend to be um, large national companies and, and they, they, they don't always get, get that right. Um, even if you get that, even if that's your starting point, look at it carefully. Think about whether it applies to you. Think about what's missing. Don't feel like you're, you're buying a product that can be sent out. Same goes, same goes if I draft it. it w whenever we do this in the cover email, we say read through every policy carefully and make sure that it's something that you're already doing or that you plan to start doing now. If not, I want to talk to you and I want to get, I want to get that policy right. Um, if you feel like you're up for this project, um, that's another option. You know, start drafting these. There are sample policies on the internet that you, that you can find, that you can, you can develop. My caution is that shouldn't be your only step, right? You probably don't have all the, all the necessary expertise. 
I probably don't have all the necessary expertise. And that's why um, our, our handbooks that, that we do always go through, in addition to the client size, go through three sets of eyes at the firm. Um, two attorneys and, um, and one administrative assistant who helps with the, the formatting, the proofreading, you know, issue spotting, so on and so forth. So don't feel like you, you should be able to take on this project yourself. You shouldn't. It's not a one person mm -hmm. job. One person might do 80% of it, but you need some other eyes on this. And so the two options there are, you know, are you going to have, um, that, that, I, that I recommend following here, if you decide to go that route, is draft the, in, draft the new handbook in-house with legal review. It doesn't need to be me. I'd love for it to be me. Um, but, uh, but it should be someone who knows Massachusetts employment law. Right? Both of those things are important. Massachusetts law and employment law. Um, there's a lot of lawyers out there. Uh, your brother-in-law might be a lawyer. Um, make sure if, if he's the one to do it that, um, that, that he has employment law um, expertise. And, and then lawyers draft with, with in-house review. Again, as with the payroll company, I think I'm going to do a better job in the payroll company. I'm pretty confident that I am, but that doesn't mean you should say, you know, I got this from Schwartz Hannum. I got this from Gary Finley. He's a great speaker. I know he's going to be a great, uh, great writer of employee handbooks, but you know your practice way better than I do. Um, I'm giving you what I think works for you. You need to make sure that it is. I'm giving you something that, that works for the law and that I think works for you. Um, you need to make sure that, that it does in fact work for you. All right, so I've mentioned this before. I don't, want to be, I don't want to belabor it, but if you're going through the handbook audit, if you're ready to do a major revision, you need to understand what employee handbook, if any, you have in place, um, any standalone policies. You're not required by law to have an employee handbook. You are required to hand people certain policies. Um, examples are the new Mass Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, you need to give that to new employees. You need to give that to, give that to employees when you know when one has informed you that, that they are pregnant um, about their rights. Really handy to have that in your employee handbook. There are other policies um, that help you out legally, but you're not required to give people. So um, a sexual harassment policy is something that's going to help you defend against a lawsuit um, that a, a, a fellow employee sexually harassed another employee. You're not legally required to give it to them, but if you do give it, give it to them, you're gonna get a presumption in favor of your practice when, when, when the person says, um, I was sexually harassed by my fellow employee, you can turn around and say, well, well um, they were told not to sexually harass you, and you were told if you were sexually harassed that you should come to us so, so we can deal with it before, before a lawsuit happens. All right, so, um, so there are lots of reasons to have an employee handbook, to gather everything um, in, into one place, even though having a handbook per se is not, is not legally required. And so, so once you decide you do want an employee handbook, and I would say everyone should have one, right? I said it's not legally required, but you should have one. What kind do you need? Um, you, might only need you might be at the point where you revise, a key, where, where you say, this is in great shape. Um, I've looked at it. Um, it was drafted a couple of years ago. I think it does reflect what we actually do here. Um, but this policy is, this policy is a little off. Um, you might just need to revise a few policies. That's, that's kind of best case scenario. I've never seen an employee handbook where I've said, you know, this is, this is in great shape, but you know, this, this is ready to go. Check mark, happy face. Um, so you're going to need to revise a few policies at, 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 at the very minimum. Um, create a mini handbook. And so that's the first hand up that I give you. The mini handbook is about 20 to 25 pages. And that is useful for a, a small employer. I would say probably no more than 10 to 15 employees. Um, and those policies have been specifically chosen as those ones that are legally required, um, as those ones that, that come up very often um, in, smaller, uh, in smaller workplaces. Uh, it's going to have uh, really important at will language at the beginning. It's going to say that it doesn't have that, that the employee handbook itself does not form a contract. 
Uh, but it's also going to have policies like the Equal Employment Opportunity Policy, which says that you don't discriminate. You don't discriminate against anyone for any reason, but specifically these ones that are, um, that are prohibited by law. It's going to have um, an employee conduct policy, which is going to list, it, list the things that you, the um, qualities that you want employees to have and the specific things that you don't want them to do, um, which again is going to be useful if you ever have to uh, fire someone or if you're if you're talking to them about their about their job performance. Um, you know, th these are the ways that, that you're falling that you're falling short. Um, I'm going to skip ahead because the comprehensive handbook is the other one that, that you have there. Um, this is one that we would give to a, a large employer, uh, 50 or more employees probably. Uh, and even with that, it's, it, there's some policies that, that, that might not work. And so it's kind of like, a, like an a la carte menu. Um, I can tell you which ones are, are strongly recommended, which ones we consider indispensable, and which ones are very employer, employee specific. That's going to be about 80 to, uh, 80 to 110 pages. So, so they're very long. Um, employers are often surprised by, by how long they are and say, what, what are you lawyers doing to me? Um, but what we're doing is we're, is we're protecting you as, as, be as best we can because all those policies were added uh, because, of, because of trouble that, uh, that other people have gotten into before by not having those policies. Uh, and then there's, there's a basic handbook which runs about 50 to 60 pages. And you all might be in this kind of, um, this kind of range. It's going to be organized like the comprehensive handbook, but it's going to um, eliminate policies that only apply to really big employers or ones that come up very infrequently and might just not be in, in, your, in your contemplation. I haven't given you that, um, that uh, handbook um, table of contents. I do have one like that, uh, but uh, again, it kind of follows the same pattern, um, follows the same categories as the comprehensive handbook, but, um, but, but eliminates some of those policies that, that don't come up very often. Um, again, as, as I mentioned before, I, I think that, that one thing to, to get away from is this idea that the employee handbook is something that people are, you know, people are given one day they read the whole thing, they sign the form, and, um, and they never look at it again. One thing that an employee handbook can do is to be something that is more like a reference book. Um, I, I just found out I'm pregnant. Um, I, wanna, I wanna know how that, um, how that works, and so I'm gonna look out this policy. I need to take, uh, I need to take the leave of absence. Um, I'm not getting paid uh, overtime. Uh, I think I should be. You know, what, what, what's the overtime policy? All right, this is one that just happened to one of our clients and it's um, uh, so, so, I, so I adapted it here. When faced with a suspension over repeated unexcused absences and rudeness to the families of patients, read of interceptionists made management aware of a provision in the practice's progressive discipline policy that allows any employee facing discipline to file a formal appeal with the practice manager. The policy Further provides that except in cases in which patient safety is threatened, any discipline related to the subject matter of the appeal will be stayed until the PM can conduct a formal investigation with all findings to be memorialized in a detailed written report. Um, all these uh, quotation marks, by the way, are things that were actually mentioned in, in the policy. Um, if not satisfied with the outcome of the investigation, the aggrieved employee then may file an appeal with the practice's managing partner who must conduct an independent inquiry. What should the practice do next? What's that? That should be the second thing they do. Um, yes, um, this is a bad policy. In fact, um, you, you may have seen um, or may have an employee handbook with progressive discipline policies. We ask that you move away from them. This one is particularly a great uh, because, because all it takes is the word of an employee um, and it puts in, lot, puts in uh, motion this whole chain of events. Um, what should you do? You have to follow the policy. You have to follow the policy. Um, and so what happened in real life was the, um, was the employer had to follow the policy, conduct the PM or 
person in that equivalent position. Um, did all of the uh, did all of the interviews and um, and wrote a detailed written report, which not surprisingly was appealed to the person on the higher level, who then had to spend all of their time um, evaluating the appeal, um, having their lawyers look things over and make sure they didn't say anything um, anything wrong, and eventually it was just such a problem that they offered this person a severance package, and the person was asked asked to leave, and so ended up costing a lot of time and a lot of money just because the policy is something that, you know, if someone would have read and would have said, yeah, we don't want that in here, then they would have saved all, all that time and, and money. And so that's not necessarily kind of an audit issue even. It's a more kind of annual review. Let's make sure there's nothing crazy in here um, and pull it out and, and, and republish. Excuse me. Are you suggesting get rid of um, progressive discipline? Uh, I, I am suggesting, yeah, our recommendation would get rid of progressive discipline. Or, um, but the steps in a progressive discipline policy are often very reasonable, things you would like to hold to, things that in most situations you, you want to follow. And so my, my, my simple answer is yes, get rid of progressive, dis progressive discipline. My more, um, my more subtle answer is, Let's write, the, let's write that policy in such a way that it deals with discipline in a reasonable way, but still allows the employer the right to, um, the right to skip steps, if, if, if you will. You know, if there's something particularly egregious that, that happens that, that's obvious, you want to be able to fire that person on the spot in certain situations. I'll admit, most of the time that's not the case. Most of the time you want to sit, to pe sit down with people and, um, and, and look to help them, help them improve their performance. Um, so we, we, we have a policy on discipline, but we never call it progressive discipline. And we outline the steps, but never say, you know, you, you can't skip ahead to step three um, if, if, you, if you want to. And maybe that, that something called the progressive discipline policy um, actually has that, has that wiggle room built in, in which case it, it's, it's probably good. talked about this before, but it relates, to, it relates to the last slide. Though it seems obvious, the policies contained in the employee handbook should reflect the actual or planned practices of the organization. The handbook should never contain policies that overpromise, are borrowed from a, another organization, and include a <coughs> careful analysis and review. So they can be borrowed, but they just have to fit you also. Um, or that are vestigial. Um, like, like the last one. We used to do this 30 years ago, um, and, uh, and now we do it this way. Um, no, we, now even though we don't do this way, it, it's, it's in our handbook. It's very likely that this policy um, was borrowed from a, union, um, a unionized employer um, who often have these type of progressive discipline policies um, as part of their agreement. Um, they're also that that type of uh, type of policy was also uh, more popular decades ago, uh, more common. Uh, so organizing your practices handbook. That's project. After determining that the handbook on the key drive was drafted internally but never distributed, and after gathering several standalone policies and speaking with the partners regarding the organization's actual practices, it's likely came to our presentation. It's just done everything right. Uh, Pat decides to begin drafting a comprehensive employee handbook. Pat wonders how to organize the handbook. Uh, what are Pat's options? I've seen, lot, I've seen lots of different ways that handbooks are organized. Yes? Your table of contents. That's what I was just going to say. <laughs> Probably you're nicely organized. I'm going, to get, I'm going to get into that a little bit and describe why we think, why we think that works particularly well. But we also have clients who say, our handbook is written this way. It's been this way for a long time. People like the way, like the way it's organized. And we say, fine, yeah, let, 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 let's do it that way. And so we fit, so we fit our policies into kind of use, using their logic. I've seen ones that are alphabetized, um, which has a certain logic to it. You know, if I want to uh, want to find out about vacation time, I go back to the V's. And so it kind of serves that function of being very, um, uh, being very much like a, uh, like a reference book. And I think, that, I think that's a good thing. 
Um, if you see the payroll companies, they, they have their certain codes for everything. And so I'll often know that if we're getting one that was written by a payroll company, that's like section 5.06, um, and so they have all their internal logic. Um, I've also seen ones that are uh, organized according to when the policies were adopted, so chronologically. And the only real advantage that I can see to that is that it makes it really easy to, to edit it uh, and just slap on the new policy at the end. But I don't think those are particularly helpful in terms of people trying to find uh, trying to find the policies that they need. Um, but I will transition into our kind of preferred option. Again, we'll work with you with whatever you have, but we think this makes some, this makes some logical sense. Um, the life of the employment relationship, and so basically what it goes from is hiring to kind of everyday things that happen in the office to um, to um, things that come up less frequently, like, like vacation time, what your benefits are, how you get paid, and then discipline and termination at the end. And so I won't, um, won't belabor this too much right here because it's subject to several other slides later as, as we break it down, um, but say that um, it's also in that handout of the comprehensive handbook. Um, the basic handbook table of contents you have follows this logic but it's so short that breaking it down into, into these eight or so sections seems a little bit silly. All right, so introductory material. Welcomes employees to practice. It kind of follows, uh, performs two major functions. And one is to kind of introduce people to the practice in a way that's, that's really personal and then put some important disclaimers up front as well. So one very kind of legal um, legal function and one kind of more interpersonal function. Uh, may discuss the practice's mission, history, and philosophy. We get in a lot of handbooks with a lot of personality. Um, we have a number of school clients. That's one of our one of our big um, big practices. And then also startups. And a lot of these um, a lot of these handbooks tend to be. Um, very particular, have a lot of, have a lot of personality in them. Um, and unfortunately, we end up switching a lot of that because, um, because it's important that legal language be precise um, instead, of, instead of kind of cute. However, in this introductory material, it's a great chance to set a good first impression, to explain who you are, the type of employees that, that you value, what your mission is. Um, and so, this introductory material is a great time because you don't get to do it so much in the rest in your uh, in your equal employment opportunity or sexual harassment policy. Um, but in here, um, great chance to kind of show who you are. Um, key disclaimers should be included in the beginning. So the, the about the at will relationship, you want to mention this as many times as possible if your employees are at will. So if they don't have have a contract that uh, provides them certain protections in, uh, for. Um, such as um, they need to be terminated for cause. But you want to set up this, um, this default of, of at will. So you can, you can leave the practice anytime you want. You can be terminated anytime um, that, that, that the employer sees necessary. Uh, and also that disclaimer, this handbook does not create a contract. All right. So what that says is you're not going to be held as an employer to, to, to all, to all of these policies. Um, and, um, that's helpful to have in there. It doesn't always it doesn't always hold up, but it's an important thing to, to mention and set the expectations that you can change these policies at any, any time, um, with or without notice, is another another type of thing that's mentioned in here. Okay, and so the next section is general employment policies. And these have to do with things like background checks, um, beginning work, employment classifications. Code of conduct is one that I'm going to highlight is again really important. And so you'll notice even in our basic handbook, you have that code of conduct. States a basic philosophy and again lists a number of things that, 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 are, that are prohibited. Hopefully you have one of these. Um, outside employment talks about um, that the person um, can work for other people, maybe, but this is their primary, this is their primary job. A um, couple, of, couple of important ones that I wanted to, to spend a little bit of time with are employment classifications. Um, you know what this is, but you may not, um, may not be familiar with the terminology. Uh, what's included in an employment classification section? Anyone know? Type of like 
full-time, part-time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. full-time, part-time, <clears throat> um, temporary, probationary, um, some combination of, of, of those. Meaning sometimes you can have um, full-time, temporary, part-time, temporary. Um, you want to describe that in, in here. What, why do I care? Why, why does anyone care? Doesn't it seem obvious? Everyone's seen these in handbooks before. Um, they're in almost every handbook, but but who cares? Just to the uh, benefits. That's a, that's exactly right. So the reason that this is important to mention here is it's connected to things that are mentioned in the rest of the handbook. So certain benefits are determined based on generally whether someone's full time or part time. Temporary employees generally get very few, if any, benefits, and so. In later sections of the, um, of the handbook, you need to refer back to this. But you also need to be very careful, and this is one of the things that, that, that we cross-check, um, is you know, if, if full-time employee is, um, is identified as someone who works um, 32 or more hours a week, but if you only get health insurance if you work 40 hours a week, you should not be saying that all full-time employees get health insurance. You should say all full-time employees who work 40 hours or more in a typical week or whatever it is that your health insurance policy says. Um, you should make sure, you should make sure that, that this, this definition lines up with everything else because it's very common that different benefits will have, di will have different thresholds. Uh, and then exempt versus non-exempt employees um, and these are, as, as I'm sure you probably know, um, being exempt versus being non-exempt determines whether you are entitled to, um, to overtime and whether you need to be paid minimum wage. And uh, one of the mistakes that I see here, which is why I put it here, is, is very often um, employee handbooks will get into way too much detail about this, about what the exemptions are, the administrative exemptions, so on and so forth. Really all that you need to mention here in exempt versus non-exempt employee is that uh, exempt employees do not need to be paid, um, paid time and a half for overtime, but non-exempt employees do need to be paid time and a half for overtime and, they're, um, and they need to be paid um, at least minimum wage. But um, so, so, so this is mentioned here for the same reason that employment classifications are mentioned in this part of the handbook because it determines other policies. So exempt employees are going to report their time in different ways than non-exempt employees. And so that's why it's kind of upfront in the beginning um, in this kind of general employment policies, uh, policies section. Whenever I take a look at an employee handbook, I add the word generally about 40 to 50 times. And if you're gonna be the person taking the first pen to your employee handbook, I would suggest thinking about using the word generally. In order to allow for flexible application of handbook policies and avoid over-promising, handbook drafters frequently make use of words and phrases such like generally, typically, it is customary, in most instances, et cetera. Um, why is that useful? It's not concrete. It basically allows you a little bit of discretion. It states something as aspirational. This is what we like to do, rather than making it sound contractual. Where I see this come up most often, um, almost every employer has a, um, uh, has a policy regarding performance evaluations and very few employers do performance evaluations as often as they say they will. Um, I'm sure this is no news to, to most of you. Some employers are great about it, most are not. But if you say um, employers receive a formal, employees receive a formal evaluation once every six months, and then you wanna fire someone for a performance-based reason, um, they, they might come back and say, um, well, how was I supposed to know I wasn't meeting expectations? You didn't follow your policy. You said I was going to have, um, have two performance evaluations a year and I, and I didn't get them. And so you want to avoid falling into this trap. And so use, use the word generally 
judiciously. Um, but be careful. Some policy language cannot be equivocal due to legal requirements and other concerns. I might give you a ridiculous one so you can see how that works. The EEO policy should not say the practice generally does not discriminate on the basis of race because you are legally uh, prohibited from discriminating on the basis of race. And hey, you're not going to do it anyway because it's just the wrong thing to do. So, so you can say that. Um, whereas something like the, um, like the evaluation process, you might not be able to stick to that. You can stick to this one, um, and you, sh you should say that you are. Uh, the workplace. This section provides key information regarding day-to-day -day matters, like um, employee conduct, reporting harassment, uh, dress code and appearance, use of cell phones, etc. Um, the one that I, the one that I wanted to highlight is so this kind of wide ranging talks about what happens in, in the office every day. Um, again, I mentioned that issue of reporting harassment, how that's a really important policy to, to have. Um, uh, but the one thing I want to um, highlight for you is, is social media. Uh, show of hands, and I'm sorry I can't see the people off site, but um, who has uh, who has a social media policy in their in their handbook? Right. So. Um, maybe about maybe about a third a third of you do, um, and what tends to be included in a social media policy? Um, ours is kind of vague. It just says you know that you can't put, you know you can't post anything about the business without permission. You know if there's anything that you felt like in, even on your own personal social media because you know they type us certain things that we have yeah be offered to have that respect of being asked for portrayed that way or at least rectifying it. We can't do that with our patients, but we can do so. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's one thing we have to be really careful about telling employees what what to do. And um, with, with the National Labor Relations Board um, has given a lot of guidance um, over the past few years, um, and it's kind of swung back and forth um, with with the political winds to say, you know, what what exactly employees employers can can prohibit. Um, and so this is one that um, that that involves kind of careful careful consideration. Um, and maybe consulting with, with an attorney. So you can, you can tell people they should not be disparaging your products um, and services, but you can't say something like, don't, at broad as, don't say anything bad about the employer because, because employees are allowed by law um, to, um, to complain about working conditions in a, in a concerted way. Um, so the National Labor Relations Act protects employees to kind of unionize, but also less formally to complain about working conditions so that they can improve working conditions. Um, and so you walk a fine line with the social media policy in allowing them to do the things they're legally, legally allowed to do, but prohibiting other things that may be inappropriate. So you can very easily say, you know, you're not allowed to harass fellow employees um, online. Um, you, um, you can tell them in certain, um, in certain situations to, uh, to clarify that they're speaking for themselves and not, and not for the business. But again, you know, this is one to approach with, with some caution. If you're doing it yourself, to read up about to make sure that you're not, um, you're not crossing a line into prohibiting things that, that shouldn't be prohibited. Um, and, um, and, and maybe, maybe seek some legal counsel as, as well. Health and safety is the next section, and it provides information uh, report it regarding reporting workplace injuries, reasonable accommodations, alcohol and drugs in the workplace, smoking, workplace violence prevention, and more. Um, I wanted to highlight um, a couple here because these are ones that the law has changed in um, just over the past two years. So pregnancy-related um, accommodations, Everyone should now have a policy um, with Massachusetts law, um, uh, Massachusetts Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, um, you're required to give employees notice of, of this law and of your business's compliance with it. Uh, among other things, um, it allows, um, allows workers to, um, it, um, to enter into the interactive process um, much, much like the ADA, um, and it all it 
goes further than the ADA in certain situations by saying that certain accommodations um, are presumed to be reasonable uh, for pregnant workers. So um, if they request, uh, if a pregnant worker requests more frequent or longer breaks, uh, time off to attend, um, uh, attend pregnancy complication, uh, to attend to a pregnancy uh, complication or to recover from childbirth, if they request light duty um, or a, a, a private non-bathroom space uh, for expressing breast milk, that is something that you presumptively um, have to provide. And if not, you better have a really good reason for it. Um, talk to se several small employers, and often that kind of having a private space, having an extra room um, for, for lactation is something that, that involves some, some logistical figuring out. But law says you, you, you should be doing it unless you can say it's unreasonable, and uh, you can't. <laughs> so do it. Yes? Is there a threshold of the size? Six. Six. So this, this applies to um, even very small employers. So if you have fewer than, fewer than six, um, Massachusetts Pregnant Workers Fairness Act doesn't apply, um, but they wanted to set it really, really, uh, really, really low to, um, to highlight the importance of, of this. Just a couple of detailed questions. Yeah. Uh, how much time do you have to give them during the day for expressing the milk? Uh, we had an employee who was in there for an hour and a half, twice a day. Um, she thought that was reasonable. Uh, so we go through things like that as well. Yeah. So. Um, so that, that's definitely where things get a little hazy with the, with the reasonable accommodation. Um, you know, part of it is kind of the medical aspect of it, but also part of it is, you know, reasonable to you. You know, do you have someone to, who can cover that, that hour and a half? And, and if you can, then you, you're pro you probably have, have to do it. Um, I would say the, the term reasonable is uh, generally tends to be very broadly interpreted um, and so if you do want to kind of put your foot down about an issue related to, to that, then um, I, 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 tread, I tread very lightly. But you don't have to pay them for those breaks, correct? You do not have to pay them for those breaks. So if they're taking an hour and a half, then you just don't pay for that. Yeah, um, which, which, which makes... It's difficult to understand the market. Right, I get it. But I'm just saying, we have the same issue and we stop paying it. Yeah, and you know, and, and maybe viewed as reasonable to, and may may not be to you, but to bring on you know someone part time for the six months or year, however long, however long that happens. That's the other issue: is how long you have to support the three years, seven years. So the Massachusetts Massachusetts law is um, is less specific um, and more open ended. Um, I believe under the um, under the ADA. Um, where, where this was kind of dealt with before, um, even though pregnancy is a, is a disability, they, they, they're able to work that in, into this. I think it was closer to closer to nine, nine months. There was there was more of a more of a hard cap on that. Ayanna, did you have something in back? I just wanted to ask if you could repeat the questions. Oh yes, uh, so, sorry, I, I, I've been I've been forgetting that. Yeah. Don't worry. Sorry. Uh, sorry. One more. Yeah, go ahead. You said you don't have to pay them for the breastfeeding time, but does that include our salaried employees? Um, so the question was, uh, for salaried employees, do you have to do you have to continue to pay them? Um, and the answer to that is is yes. Um, so you mean right. like the not doctors or nurse practitioners that take that time out where they're completely not making money, and they're but they're also exempt. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you, you can also require other job duties, so I mean, you could conceivably, you know, require them to stay longer. Make phone calls while they're doing <laughs> 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 the triage. I, I have not heard of that. I think, uh, <laughs> what, what's that swishing noise? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Pat's prodigious problem. After a month of research and drafting by Pat, Peninsula Pediatrics Draft Employee Handbook has ballooned from about 20 pages to a full 70 pages, and Pat has not even started drafting a compensation and hours for its section. Is this a problem? What are the disadvantage what are the advantages and disadvantages of having a lengthy handbook? Yeah. I mean, it might be that that you want to communicate. Um, the, the audience member said um, that one problem might be that people don't read it if, if it's too long. Um, and I mentioned an approach that you know don't necessarily view it as something that everyone needs to read in one sitting. But I do think there is something to be said for having a brief twenty to twenty-five page handbook that you can follow 
um, and that every, everyone understands the policies. And maybe if something comes up in the future, you develop a new policy and, and you add it. So I would say if Pat has a decent sized practice, maybe uh, 20 people, that 70 doesn't make me flinch at all. But if there's, if there's five or six you know, to 10 people who work there, uh, you know, seven pages per employee sounds uh, sounds a little bit sounds a little bit long, um, but it is it is a matter of, of culture. If people do like to have specific rules for everything, then maybe consider going with with a longer handbook. If you've had certain issues with things in the past, you want to make sure to include those those policies in there. Next section is compensation of hours and work. Uh, compensation and hours of work is maybe the one that's most interesting to, to your employees and ones that they're one they're going to hold you to. Uh, attendance and punctuality, time and attendance reporting, flexible working arrangements, overtime, meal breaks, paydays, uh, emergency closings, payroll deductions, etc. The flexible working arrangements is one that I think is a really interesting policy and one that um, you know some of you can maybe allow for for telecommuting with certain classes of employees, it may be very desirable to do so. It may help you bring on the, the, the type of people that you want. Um, one thing that I would say is if you do have a work from home policy, for example, make sure that it's very detailed regarding the expectations. And number two, make sure that the employer has the discretion to make people come into the office um, for any reason or no reason. So if they violate those policies or it just isn't working for the business of, of the employer anymore, um, you want to make sure to have that, uh, have that wiggle room. But again, you know, this is a policy that, uh, that again, might help you attract the, uh, attract the right type of employees. Um, paydays, just so you know, um, in Ma Ma every state has their own laws regarding when people need, when people need to be paid. Um, and so you need to make sure to, to follow that. Um, and uh, payroll deductions, uh, things that you can take out of people's paycheck. Um, and also you should have a policy, um, most employers should have a policy that says in case of overpayment, um, that, uh, that, that the uh, uh, practice can take things, to, can take money back. Um, that happens sometimes. Benefits. Um, so this is a section that is, is often the most employer specific that we see. Uh, most of the uh, benefits are not legally required. Um, and so you see that first list that is not legally required. Um, what you, what you want to do with this pol these policies is to give a summary of the plans that you have in place. Usually your policy on, uh, for example, health insurance would be one paragraph long. As you know, your health insurance policy is way longer than one page, and so uh, one one paragraph. And so, what you do is you mention that um, in case of um, or just see, see the full plan. Um, and in the case of any disagreement between this document and the plan documents, that the plan document governs. So, what you want to do this is kind of a, your headlines. These are the type of benefits that you're entitled to. If you want to learn more, talk to HR talk to the PM, um, and, re and read your policy. So just enough to give people an idea of what they're entitled to, but you can't get into all the legalese here. You can't get into all the details. Uh, there are some um, benefits that are legally required. These should be mentioned in your employee handbook. And so examples of those are workers' compensation, social security, unemployment. Um, soon, as you know, Massachusetts paid family and medical leave. Um, will be one of those. All right, so another uh, non-PAT um, situation. In late May of this year, Island Pediatrics, Pediatrics switched to a new payroll company. As a result of a peculiarity in the payroll company's um, platform and the way it accounts for time off, Island Pediatrics decided to grant each of employees an additional three weeks of paid time off for this year only, on top of any of the unused portion of the three weeks the employee was granted at the beginning of the calendar year. So their uh, payroll company, the new payroll company, was not capable of counting um, vacation time properly, and so this employer said, eh, take six weeks of vacation this year. On June 1st, a registered nurse at the practice resigns only having used one week of her vacation time since January 1st. Does the practice have to pay the departing employee for any of her unused vacation time? How much and why? 
This what is a, she's okay. earned. Sorry? What she's earned. So the, so the, uh, the answer is, is they need to pay what she's earned, which is how much? The math problem here. Yeah, all of it. So five weeks. So, so you need to say you need to pay a full five weeks. Um, this is a question that I got from a um, from an employer um, just the other week. They, they weren't too happy about this, um, but she, according to the, the terms of you know what they already told her um, and, and what she's entitled to in the employee handbook, you need to pay her five weeks um, for leaving on June first. Um, what? Um, how could the how could the employer have avoided this? What's that? Accruing instead, but, of, by, instead of front loading. It. Right. The, the the answer was was accruing instead of front loading. So um, as you draft your uh, vacation policy, um, one way to do it is to give people a lump sum of days off at the beginning of the year, um, and then they use them as they go. The danger of this is exactly what happened here: is if someone leaves early in the year, they get all their time. Another way of setting up is accruing, so you earn. Uh, two days after, for every month of work, and that way, if someone leaves in the middle of the year, you're less likely to be on hook on the hook for a lot of this. Um, yes. Me. Um, so, if, it's, if you have it in your, in your handbook, handbook. Thank you. Um, if it's in the handbook, is there a way to prorate that if they do leave? I mean, can you put that in the handbook that way, and then you would be required to pay them all that time if you do front load that amount of hours. So the, the question is, um, is, is there a way to, to do it in your handbook to, to prorate it? Um, and I think, I think what the answer is, is kind of exactly what we're talking about. That you know, once it's in the handbook, that it's front loaded, um, then, that, then you're required to pay that. But if you rewrite your policy so that people earn as they go, um, then you don't have to pay in the middle of the year. But that needs to be done kind of prospectively. Um, and so if I were to roll out a new policy, um, I would probably start it, you know, just out of, out of fairness, I would start it January, January 1, um, and, and to avoid kind of a legal challenge. And I'd give, I'd give the employees notice that that's changing. Uh, another issue that we run into with, with employee handbooks um, and, the, um, and vacation policies is to make sure that you have a use it or lose it provision in your handbook so that you know, if by the end of the year um, you've not used your, your vacation time, you lose it. That is legal under, under Massachusetts law, but only if you say, only if you say that that's what that's what you're going to do. Um, there are other ways to do that. So, um, so for example, you allow them to roll over half their time. You roll allow them to roll over half their time until March, and and then and then they lose it that kind of avoids the situation where someone wants to take a vacation day on January 2nd and you say, sorry, you've only earned 0.3 hours um, so far. Um, and so, so there are ways to do this to, to make it work for you. Um, we're happy to, help, happy to help you do that, but, um, but you don't want to be on the hook for a, for a large number of days. Some employers are comfortable with that front loading, um, taking the risk that they're going to do. You're going to have to pay people for an extra three weeks if, if they leave in the middle of the year. Um, or, or if they're terminated in the middle of the year, some, some, are, some are not, and, um, and understandably. Can we ask a question from um, Bridgewater? Yes, please. Um, you can say it, and I'll repeat it. Okay. Um, so we, is it, are we legally obligated to pay vacation time? Yeah. Um, so whatever they have in their bank, we have to pay. Um, the question is, are practices legally obligated to pay out vacation time, whatever is in their bank? Yeah, so, so if I understand the question correctly, um, if, if they've already earned it, so, so that's, why, that's why I understand, meaning like if, if they're in their bank, um, then you are legally required to, to pay that to them upon their departure. However, you can, you can make a rule where at the end of the year, um, that, bank, that bank is emptied or cut in half or, or, or what have you. Does that, does that answer the question? Is that true? Yes. Is that, is that true for sick time too? Is that true for sick time as well? That is not true for sick time because you only earn sick time if you're actually sick, right? You're only entitled to, to use that um, if, if, if you're unwell. So, um, so it only applies to vacation time. 
it does not apply to sick time. So you're not, you do not have to pay out sick time at all, regardless of how much they've earned, um, unless for some reason you've said that you will. And if they stratify out personal time, do they need to pay that out? Personal time would probably be, I would say personal time is, uh, is kind of in the middle, but if you have a, um, if you have a policy where, you know, there are certain steps you need to take in order to uh, qualify for personal time. So if it can only be used for, for certain, um, uh, for certain reasons then I would say it's not earned time. And so they're, so they're not entitled to it. Thank you. Usually it's fewer, usually it's fewer days of personal time. It's like two to five. So it's, so it's not so much of an issue, but if there are certain criteria that they need to meet, I would say they don't have to pay out personal time at the end either. If, if you pool vacation, personal, and sick time, like if you say you get 20 days, um, you do need to pay that out because, because they could have used it all for vacation time. All right, so I have a few more slides to, uh, to make it through. I do want to leave some time at the end. I, I apologize, everything always uh, uh, always slows down a little bit, but um, great, great questions. Hopefully I'm getting some of them answered as we go. Uh, so time off um, is, is the next section. It contains policies related to leave, some of which are optional, um, some of which are required by federal law, FMLA, military leave, some of which are required by state law, sick leave, jury duty, small necessities leave. So all of these have different thresholds. We talked about FMLA being, being 50. Um, you don't have to give vacation leave. You don't have to give bereavement leave you do not need to give personal time. Um, you probably don't need to give FMLA leave unless, unless you're a very large practice having over 50 people. Military leave, um, USERA is the, is the acronym for that. Um, that applies to all employers regardless of size, um, some of which are required by, um, by state law. Uh, sick leave, does anyone know the number on that? Mass in Massachusetts, you do have to give sick leave regardless of the size um, of, your, of, of the employer, of, of the employer, but you have to pay them for it if you have 11 or more employees. Yeah, so, yeah, so almost, exact, almost exactly right. Um, small necessities leave follows the same categories as FMLA leave. So what do you mean they have to pay it? I guess that was a bit of a question. Like, I mean, I... What do you mean they have to pay for, for sick leave? Yeah. So if, so if your employer who has nine employees, um, you need to allow your employee to take sick leave and you can't fire them for it, um, but you don't have to pay them. If you have 12 employees, you can't fire them for taking sick leave, but you need to pay them for it. And it's, um, I think it's five days, 40 hours a year, um, and there's a specific formula. Um, so like one hour for 30 hours work. Exactly, yeah. So you're saying uh, as an employer, like if you don't, so I have to allow them to earn it, yeah, but if they're if I'm less than nine employees, I don't have to pay out at the same time. Exactly. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it, 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 it's eleven. It might be one of those ones where, where you choose to do it to remain competitive with other employers, or just because you know you have a philosophy you don't want to pay people for you don't want to not pay people because they're sick. Uh, but certainly you're entitled to do that. Um, but uh, but you could adopt a policy that's more lenient. Yes. You have earned time, which includes vacation, sick, holiday time. Yeah. Under the state law, do we have to differentiate how much of that is sick now? No, no, as long as they have, as long as you meet the threshold for, for the amount of sick time, you, you're, you're fine with, with the uh, policy like, like that because the other, um, uh, the other time that you're given is complete, that you're giving them is completely optional. So as long as you're over that 40 hours, you're being more generous than the law requires you to be. Uh, and so, so as, I, as I was kind of hinting at before, to make this point very clearly, a handbook should only include time off policies that are legally required for an employer of your size and location or that you've chosen that you're going you're gonna to honor regardless of the fact the law doesn't apply to you. All right, so as you go through, your, as you go through those, those time off policies, make sure they either apply to you or you're going to pay, you're gonna pay people or let them take that time anyway. Uh, Performance improvement. Um, this is what we talked about before a little bit in terms of the progressive discipline. We don't, um, we don't recommend using the term progressive discipline or providing a policy that, that guarantees kind of locks, a lockstep approach. 
but your policy does want to um, want to allow for performance improvement and to discuss some steps that, that you might take to help the employee um, improve and if necessary later later part ways um, and, and you, you, you probably do in most cases want to follow um, a natural process and so you should mention the, these types of um, steps being verbal warnings written warnings suspension with or without pay uh, termination of, of employment um, sometimes you'll see uh, what we call a last chance letter um, that kind of outlines specific steps that you want someone to take by a certain date um, in order to keep, keep their employment. Um, and so this is something that we also talk to employers about pretty, pretty frequently. Um, and one of the things that, that we always ask when, when we're asking if, if, if you're going to terminate an employee, will, will this take them by surprise? Have you spoken with them about this before? Again, sometimes the uh, behavior might be so extreme that you need to terminate them. Um, but often, you know, you're going to want, you're going to be more sympathetic if someone says that you discriminate against them and you're saying we fired them for good reasons. If you've talked to them before, if there are written warnings, so on and so forth. And then finally, termination of employment. I think this is my favorite uh, piece of clip art from the. Um, uh, in the whole presentation, but um, it outlines different avenues for termination, uh, being voluntary termination, retirement, involuntary termination. Um, be careful of saying things like, you know, we'd like two weeks notice. Um, you don't want to include some, you don't want to include something that um, seems to go against the at will employment relationship. Um, make sure that it's very clear that someone can quit at any time, though you request two weeks notice, or in case of um, retirement, that you, you request six months notice or something like that. But this is something that takes a little bit of, of finesse um, to make sure that people are not able to argue that, that they're entitled to certain continued employment rights. Um, it also will include uh, certain termination logistics, um, so exit interview, if applicable, final pay, this is something that, that's, that's come up before, um, but you do need to pay them out for, for earned vacation time. You do not need to pay them for, uh, for sick time. Um, there's a specific rule in Massachusetts, and this varies from state to state, as to when you need to pay someone their final pay, and the um, employers often get this wrong, but the standard is different for if you fire someone than um, if the person quits. If you fire someone, when do you need to pay them? That day. Make sure you have a check cut with everything that they've earned or, or a direct deposit made <laughs> in today's world, probably. Those those sometimes with, with in this situation, um, you might actually need to cut a check um, and, and, that, and that vacation time. If someone, um, if someone voluntarily quits, when do you need to pay them? Next Everyone's kind of right. Yes, they, they said the next, uh, the next regular payday. Someone gives their notice two weeks, you can let them go at any time, correct? The, the question is, if someone gives their notice, two weeks notice, you can let them go at any time. Yes, um, you can do that. I would, that's something that I want to make clear in that, um, in that policy um, with, with, uh, with, with the termination that we mentioned, um, where you mentioned voluntary termination. Um, often you'll see the language in there that says, you know, we request two weeks notice, but we, we will, you know, we reserve the right to, uh, to end your employment at any time within the notice period. Um, often you might kind of just as a matter of courtesy pay the person um, for that, but as if you have a good policy, technically you won't legally be required to pay them through that, uh, through that two weeks. Um, and finally, uh, an acknowledgement is the last thing that we see in a handbook, um, and um, it should be included in every handbook. We mentioned this at the beginning. A test the employee has received and is expected to read the handbook. Uh, states the practice may change policies with or without notice at any time, uh, recognizes the handbook does not create contractual rights and must be signed by the employee. Um, now, every time you reissue the handbook, you should do this. If you reissue a standalone policy, like if you revise a policy, um, I would also have the employee sign that uh, because what that's going to, what that is going to show is if this ever comes up in any sort of dispute, that they're not held to, they're held to the policy they signed subsequently. Um, and that, um, 
that is that's the acknowledgement. Um, Can we just ask a question from Bridgewater? I'm, I'm sorry, so, so um, one, one question here, then I'll take the one from Bridgewater. Um, the question was, can you do that? Um, can you send it to them electronically, the, the updates? Can you send the updates to them electronically? The, 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 the answer is yes, you can do that acknowledgement. Uh, you can do the acknowledgement itself or any updates electronically. Um, the better kind of validation you have on that, the better. So you don't just want like a, like a receipt that they open the email. Um, what you want is some sort of response where they acknowledge they've received it and, and agree to it. And it, it's, it's a, um, as long as you do that, j just like that, um, that the Massachusetts law will recognize that as, as that, just as valid as if they'd signed a physical copy. Uh, make sure you have a good system for retaining that, that receipt in case you ever need it. Um, yes, at Bridgewater. So um, related to disciplinary action, performance improvement, and termination, should you include in the handbook what the decision-making process is going to be? I know earlier you had given the example of, you know, the practice manager doing an investigation and the, uh, the partner doing an investigation. Should there be something clearly stated as to how decisions get made uh, regarding performance improvement, discipline, and uh, termination? Great, great question. And I would say that you want to walk the line between making sure that you're transparent about your process and over-promising. So I would, I would make generous use of, of the word generally um, as, as you describe this. And I'd also want to be um, ra rather vague um, and, and, and non-specific so that you're not tied into a specific process if it doesn't fit in that situation. But I, I would, you know, certainly say something like, you know, uh, disciplinary decisions are typically made by the um, H, by, by, by the practice manager in consultation with, um, you know, someone else. Maybe um, employees are, uh, you know, generally, um uh, HR will generally meet with employees to discuss their decision. Um, I, I, I kind of want to err to the side of not making too many promises along those lines, though I certainly, again, understand the, uh, the desire to kind of be, be transparent with people. So is it, is it okay to leave it out? Yes. Thank you. Um, I would say most, uh, I would say that our model policies and most that we see do, do not describe a, a process for, for, for a specific process for discipline, only kind of describe some of the, some of the steps that might be taken. So Pat has finished drafting what Pat believes to be a comprehensive employee handbook for Peninsula Pediatrics. However, having no prior experience drafting a handbook, Pat is wary about creating a group email, attaching the draft, and sending the handbook to all employees. Good Pat. Uh, what are some of the steps Pat should consider at this time? And I would say, so uh, just kind of in the, um, in the interest of time and, and the fact that my next, uh, next slide explains a lot of this, I'd say the big thing that Pat needs to do is to make sure a few more sets of eyes get, get on this handbook. And not just because he, he's new at it. I've done dozens of these. Um, and, and would never send something out without having someone else take a look at it before. And there are a number of things to consider. Who should look at the legal aspects of this? Who should look at the management aspects of this? Meaning like, are we, um, are we following this? Is this something that, that the practice leadership can, can, can sign off on? Are the roles described in the handbook? Who does what described properly? Uh, formatting and style, formatting and style, Re really important, typos, you want this to look very professional, um, and then consistency as well. Um, and someone might have a great eye for some of the other stuff, might not have a great eye for, for consistency, but again, that idea of whenever you refer to a full-time employee, it should mean the same thing. And if it doesn't, you might need to use a different term or, um, or drill down on the term um, full-time employee. Um, and then educating employees. So make sure that, that you're just not rolling this out and saying, good luck, here it is. 
um, maybe having a PowerPoint like this and explaining the changes or explaining the new handbook and some of the things that might might surprise them, kind of getting out getting out the message um, about why certain employee um, um, certain policies are in there, and then management training. Again, you know you're going to want to make sure that the policies are followed. Who's responsible for implementing these policies? The management. And if they're doing different things than it says in your handbook. You're, you're going to be in trouble. Employees will rightly say you're not following your own policies. And then, so I've talked a lot about, so the title of the program is, is kind of the, the audit. And that's really just kind of this big time intensive revision. I think this should be done, you know, every once in a while, every five years maybe, or certainly if you don't have a good handbook or you don't think you have a good handbook, now's the time to audit. But you should also look at it every year. Someone should set aside two hours once a year to read through the handbook, um, make sure that you're still following everything. Um, and, and hopefully, kind of have a lawyer, just, just call up a lawyer and say, what's new under the sun? What do I need to? Massachusetts loves to pass new laws that help employees. They do it, they do it all the time. And that, that's wonderful. But it does mean that um, you know keeps keeps uh, revisers of handbooks in business um, and keeps us on edge about what we need to do every year. Um, along those lines, just to give you an idea, these are some of the things we've changed in our model handbooks just this past year. Um, adding a pregnancy-related accommodations policy um, relates to the Mass Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. Um, related to that, the EEO policy has changed because you now need to mention pregnancy or pregnancy related condition to the list of protected classes. You're not gonna discriminate against someone because of pregnancy or because of a pregnancy related condition. Uh, updating the drug free workplace policy to address recreational use of marijuana. That's one that um, I thought we might get into a little bit more, but, uh, but, but, but didn't. But um, you, know, you, you still should be clear in your policy that even though um, the use of recreational and medical marijuana is now legal in Massachusetts, that possession of medical marijuana or me recreational mar marijuana on your, uh, on your premises is prohibited, assuming that it is, and that employees should not show up to work under the influence of, of, um, of marijuana. Um, again, um, you know, that's something, something to think about, but you wanna be clear about that, even though something's um, legal under Massachusetts law, isn't necessarily um, legal under federal law, and you want to set the expectations with regard to your workplace. Um, otherwise, someone could could rightfully argue that uh, you know I was I wasn't doing anything wrong. It, it's legal, but the same way you have an alcohol in the workplace policy, you now have to have to write your marijuana policy um, or write your drug free workplace policy to to include that, uh, including communicable illnesses policy. And this is probably an important one for, for medical practices in, in particular, uh, dealing with people who, who are sick, uh, but we added it because of, uh, of some measles outbreaks. Um, and what it provides is that if people are not immunized, then they may be prohibited from coming to work in the case of, of, of an outbreak. Um, so again, you know, it's something that not every, um, not every employer will, will want, but it's something that we've added to our model policies as, as a choice for people. It's one that we've always had in our student handbooks um, because, um, you know, people who don't vaccinate have, um, have, have been an issue for a while in the kind of younger, younger age demographic. So um, adding contributions to family and medical leave to list of optional payroll deductions. So um, I mentioned that policy where you mentioned payroll deductions. Um, you're now um, taking money out for, um, for the uh, family, Massachusetts Family and Medical Leave. Um, we don't recommend putting in a, a full Family and Medical Leave Act policy right now because people can't take the leave yet. That part of the law hasn't kicked in. They just have to pay for it now. Um, and they get to take the time off, um, time off later I think it's January 1, um, but so we're holding off on, on including that policy right now, but we'll have it ready to go. So where to go from here? Um, gather and assess your practices, current policies, decide what, decide what kind of handbook you need at this time, whether it's, whether it's the basic, might, might be just what you need, whether it's the comprehensive or whether it's something more, more intermediate, um, make changes, um, 
again, we're help, uh, happy to help with any of that, whether it's uh, just taking a look at one policy and telling you whether, whether it's good to go or whether we'd add some language, um, whether you, you want our help in drafting handbook um, and what, what size it is, happy to take a look at what you have now and, um, and get it where it needs to be. Solicit input from appropriate reviewers. Again, this is kind of the, uh, the, the guideline, have at least three eyes on this and people with specific expertise educate managers and employees, and then make sure this doesn't just uh, sit on a shelf um, gathering dust, but that someone puts a calendar reminder and takes a look at this every year and says, um, you know, when, when the things are just out of line and um, shouldn't be in there anymore, you know, I'll call them. And so um, I promised a half an hour. I've left, I've left 16 minutes, um, but maybe, maybe I answered, maybe I answered 14 minutes of questions during, during the uh, presentation, so maybe that's fair. Uh, but I have a couple questions, at least one question here, and happy to take them remotely as well. Yes. Do you recommend two handbooks for, since we have a very diverse population there, where we have like doctors who can take as much vacation as they want, they get more life insurance, <laughs> they can lunch all day long, they can eat, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I just, that's been one of the things in the handbook. I'm like, here, yeah, your life insurance policy is fine, your vacation's less year, but look at everything the doctors get. Is there? Yeah, so, so the question is here. where there's kind of two pretty distinct classes of employees who have um, vastly different benefits. So, so the doctors um, in, in your practice, as opposed to um, the kind of non clinical employees, or maybe I'm not using the right term, but um, if the doctors have vastly superior benefits, do you have two different employee handbooks? I would probably, I, I see the issue there. And um, <clears throat> what I would probably do in that case is just an addendum for, for the doctors or a smaller handbook saying, you know, all that stuff applies, um, but, but here's, here's an extra kind of packet describing your benefits. And then maybe, maybe refer to that um, at, at some point in, in the regular handbook. Yeah, but yeah, I certainly see, I mean, very little good can come of people comparing th their benefits to another. It's not something I see very often, but that's probably how, how I would approach that. Um, and I, I think there is something um, important for a community about saying like this, like these policies apply to everyone. So like the, the employee conduct, like people want to see that, that doctors are held to the same standard they are in terms of the way, the way you treat people. So, um, so I would, I would kind of, prefer prefer that 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 way um although you know if, if you want to do two separate that, that that's fine too i like that idea better just having a little addition. yeah that's what we said and it's worked okay. well okay great northampton has a question hello hello northampton hi um i have a question going back to uh, accruing vacation time sure what do you do with the employee that would like to take vacation time in either January or February and they will put them in the negative uh, for what they owe for uh, time? Uh, do you set a limit to the amount of time that can be in the negative? You, you could do that um, for, for sure. I mean, if you can make it w one week or something like that, you know, five days, I think that's, that's a very logical policy. Uh, you know, in terms of just, um, vacation time, again, it's something you're not legally required to do. So anything you're doing along those lines, and no one can say that they're, they're not getting what's legally due to them because um, any sort of vacation time that, that you pay them for is, is optional. Um, we, we recommend, um, we, we have this little kind of one page sheet that people sign if, if they're advanced on their time, which basically says, you know, I, I've, I've gotten time that I haven't earned yet, once I earn it, that will be paid back. If for some reason I'm terminated before, um, you know, I, I, won't, I won't be paid for these days. So, um, so you can do it that way. And again, the, the other way to do that is to allow, um, to allow for kind of a, a, a rollover of, of half the time or something like that in, until March. But um, yeah, cer certainly, certainly you can limit it. Um, and, and, and again, you, you might decide to have someone sign on this sheet acknowledging that they're advanced. At, at the very least, I would I'd make them sign something or write something out saying that, that they are advanced this time. They know they haven't earned it yet. So and how does that legally perspective do with that, like stealing wages from them? Because like if you, does that make sense? Like because I, I was understood with the impression that we couldn't do that because even though we 
said they had that agreement, like that would be, I forget the term they used, but it would be like stealing, it's against the law for me not to pay them for time they worked, even though it was paid in advance. W w so w wage theft, right, yeah, yeah. Is, 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 is the correct term. I, I, and so, so the question was, you know, if, if you advance them the time, if they, um, if they then quit and you didn't pay them for, for, that, for that time, is, is that illegal? Um, no, I, I, I think you'd be fine with that because basically it, what it is, is it's an advance. And so, um, so regardless of how, how you calculate the time, you will have kind of advanced them that time and then they'd have, they'd have to pay that back for you. So, um, so, so they, have, they haven't really earned that, that particular time. Do you have to put that limitation in your policy book? The limit, so are, are we going back to the- to As far as giving them say, we're only going to allow uh, you to be in the negative by one week. Yeah, I, I, I put that in your policy. If, if, that, if that's what you decide to, to adopt, um, it's always great to be able to point to something like that um, to say that that was clear. You, 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 another way to handle it would be at the time you, you can have you can have that that written up. Um, but yeah, I put put that directly in your policy. Thank you. Um, we just have a question from Bridgewater. Okay, Bridgewater. So uh, regarding vacation time and different positions within the office. So employee positions in our office have a contract. So I assume yeah. the contract uh, takes first step over the handbook. Um, okay. But nurses get more vacation time upon hire than the other office staff. Should we have that specified um, in the handbook that nurses are hired you know, with the, an extra week? Okay, so if vacation time is different for different staff levels, so not just physicians, um, NPs, but also nurses versus other admin staff, yep. should, they, should they document that in the handbook, um, what the different levels are without having to create supplements for every type of position? Yeah, I think that I think you'd be fine to include that in, in the handbook. I think, you know, at some point creating additional supplements for every sort of category becomes a little bit becomes a little bit ridiculous. Um, there's certainly nothing wrong with um, or, or nothing illegal about offering, you know, more benefits for people who have who have different roles. And so, yeah, I would um, I'd probably just include that all in, all in the policy, you know, just kind of Speaking, speaking about without without seeing it, and um, I, I, my tendency would be to say, you know, let, let, let's not let's not have ten different supplements. Let's uh, let's include that in, in the um, in the handbook. Okay, great. And we just have one more question. Yeah. Is it is it legal to take action um, with someone who habitually? Um, uh, doesn't have vacation or uses their vacation time and uses their sick time and requires additional time um, and with without pay is it is it reasonable or is it legal to say that that's a that's a performance issue if someone's not managing their time off properly yeah I, I would say I mean it's one of those issues where you want to um, you want to tread a little bit lightly because you don't want to um, you, you don't want to claim that you you kind of violate the ADA and you're discriminating against someone because because of a disability. But um, I think you know you can um, you certainly not pay them, which which, which you're always saying. You certainly make them get um, get certain documentation. Although you'd want to make sure that that's policy that you apply consistently um, for people who. For people who use all use all their time, and eventually, um, yeah, I mean, when people aren't showing up to 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 their job, um, and and they've they've already used all, all their time, you know, at some point you um, you can take action against them. Yeah, but I mean, I would want to, I'd want to consider, I, I'd want to have kind of a more in depth conversation about particulars, just to talk about about the risks of of a potential discrimination claim, but. Uh, on the whole, you, the answer to your question is, yeah, if someone's not showing up to work, if they're blowing through all their vacation time, um, they, they don't just get an unlimited number of, of unpaid day, days off with, without consequence. And we just have a follow-up, or another question. That's fine, and then, and then I have a couple in Waltham. Okay. 
So I have a question um, going back to marijuana and drugs. Sure. Uh, in the line in, in our manual, it says possessing, using, distributing, selling, or negotiating the sale of illegal drugs or other controlled substances. That's basically a violation. Can we just add in the sale of its use or sale of legal and illegal drugs, or do we have to just put in marijuana? No, I'd want, I'd want a, a particular carve out for, I, I, I would probably, if I wanted to do that, say including marijuana because um, marijuana is illegal under federal law. And so that's, that's usually how we handle it. Oh, okay. Just, spe just specify that that's including marijuana. I would, um, I would tread lightly in terms of taking action against someone for, legal, for, for off duty use of marijuana w without more. Okay. Um, that, that's kind of um, evolving legal, uh, an evolving legal issue, but um, I, I don't have any problem with, with the policy, um, but I would just be parenthetically including marijuana rather than say legal or, or illegal, because I think that, um, you know, brings within the, the sweep of use, using aspirin, right? I mean, yeah. I have one more follow-up question. Um, in this whole section that I have here, do we, ha we address firearms yeah. and um, you didn't talk about that at all, but we have a couple of people on staff that are have license to carry. Um, yeah. Is that, can someone comment on that and whether or not we should just avoid that or do we just say not allowed? You, you don't need to let them bring it on site The um, or, or, or even in the parking lot, even on the property at all in Massachusetts. In, in some states you need to, uh, you, you People can be allowed to keep it in their car if it if it's locked up in a certain way. But in Massachusetts, you're certainly within your right to to prohibit it. I mean, they have uh, they have a legal license to carry. It doesn't mean they can bring it into your workplace. Okay. Thank you. So uh, yes, question. Um, we allow our employees to pull sort of their accrued sick time and vacation time. Yeah. Just let it, let them use it however they want it. But it's not in our handbook yeah is that should we include it or just let it be so the question is they allow employees to uh to accrue uh, sorry to pool their vacation time and sick time but no mention of that is made in, in your handbook uh, my question for you is do, do you have do you have is it just that that's not in your handbook or do you not have um, a sick time or vacation time policy in your handbook we do have the sick time vacation we don't sure. uh it's not written that they could Hold it and use it however they want it. So they do have the policy in, in, in their handbook. Uh, they do have the two policies in their handbook, just not the detail about pooling. I would I would put it in your handbook um, just just to um, uh, just, just for, for the sake of clarity. Um, I think the problem that you're the potential problem that you're gonna have there, it's it's probably might be a de minimis amount of money, but I do think there'd be a good argument for any employee who leaves that they're entitled to be paid for both any accrued vacation and sick time when they leave because you have allowed that pooling to happen. But I don't think including it in your handbook or not including it in your handbook um, provides, a, I don't think that not including it in your handbook provides a better defense to that because it, it's an established practice. Um, if you would like to, if, if you're really worried about that, um, I would say that you'd want to end pooling, but in order to do that, because it has become an established practice, I think you'd want to um, you want to clarify that to to employers and sorry, employees. Okay. We have a question in Northampton. Um, let, let me just. Uh, there's one gentleman who's been waiting for a while here, and then, then I'll take the one from Northampton. I'm just going to go back to a couple of questions before on the employee that had used all the big things of time and then we're taking more time off. Yeah. Under FMLA, she's protected to do that. She's used her earned time. She's, she can take another 12 weeks off if she qualifies. That, that's, so, so, so that's correct. Um, so the question was, you know, the, the person um, might be, the person who has used all, so he's exhausted all the vacation time, may be entitled to additional time under FMLA. Um, and you're exactly right about that, which is why I said, you know, we want to talk about the particulars. Uh, but it would depend on the size, like what, whether, whether the employer is covered by FMLA. And you have to take certain steps. Um, 
and, and so, so you have to qualify for, for FMLA, um, both in terms of how long you've been um, an employee, how many hours you've worked over the past, uh, over the past year, and what type of condition that, that you have. But it's, it's something that you'd want to talk, if, if they do seem to be entitled, it's something you want to talk to that employee about before you take any disciplinary action, because that could be your seen, seen as, as retaliation. But I want to get on top of it pretty early. Uh, so Northern Northampton. So I want to just ask an, a question that has two parts with regards to social media. So we had a, a, a situation recently where there was an employee who was um, making comments about her immediate supervisor on Facebook and other employees saw it and brought it to management's attention. Yeah. And I did not discipline her, but I did have a discussion with her that it was probably not the most appropriate thing to do. Yeah. So if I'm understanding you correctly, I should not have brought it, had any discussion with her because she is technically free to make comments on her Facebook page? There are a lot of particulars about that. It needs to be about the terms of conditions of employment. It needs to be concerted activity. So there needs to, needs to be not just for her benefit, but the benefit uh, of others. However, um, and, and I would not go uh, monitoring people's email, people's Facebook proactively, but once it's been brought to you, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with speaking to the employee about, you know, we saw your um, post on Facebook. It's concerning to us for a number of reasons. You know, let's, uh, let's sit down and try to figure this out so that you can, uh, you know, address things internally rather than bringing them to Facebook. Um, you know, saying you're fired because you said something bad about, about, the, about someone else on, on Facebook. I think sometimes that's okay, depending on the situation, but, but it's something you need to be very careful about because of that law. Um, and I'll take the, um, I think Leah is, uh, want to be respectful of your time, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll take the last question, then, then I'm going to have to step aside, but I can, I can hang out for a while and, and answer other questions. So I did have one follow-up to that, is, again, on social media. So several years ago, the practice manager had put a policy into place that the management team could not be, quote-unquote, friends with um, uh, their employees, the folks that reported to them with the thought that if they saw something um, yeah. on Facebook that they would make a, either a performance judgment or, you know, if they called out sick and then there's a picture on the beach, um, <laughs> you're, make, you're making um, a, a performance evaluation based on what's on social media. And so yeah. the management team was asked to sign a policy saying they would not quote unquote friend their employees. And this caused um, uh, lots of discussion and still continues discussion yeah. now. Obviously that should not go in the handbook, but is that legal? It's legal. Um, it's legal. It, it might not be all that practical in, in this day and age, and it may have been more practical five or ten years ago that, than, it, than it is now, uh, but there's nothing illegal about it. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, you want okay. to? Uh, no, we're over. It's uh, right after two o'clock now. Thank you, everybody, for your wonderful questions. If you have further follow-up questions, you know, feel free to send them in to me, and we'll see if we can try to get more clarity around some of this. Yeah. Um, and again, I really want to thank Gary for coming out. They give us wonderful information. We're so lucky to have them as a resource. And thank you all for taking two hours plus travel out of your busy days. And we look forward to seeing you at the practice manager meeting and then at our October learning community. Thank you, everybody. Thanks,